All right. If you have your Bibles, will you turn with me to the book of Romans? Romans, chapter number 12. May I direct your attention to the 15th verse. Brother Nathaniel, Exodus, chapter number 2, verses number 3 through 6, please, sir. Brother Jesse, Galatians, chapter number 6, verse number 2, please, my brother. Brother Nathaniel, Exodus, chapter number 2, verses number 3 through 6. And when she could no longer hide him, she took for him an ark of bulrushes and daubed it with slime and with pitch and put the child therein, and she laid it in the flags by the river brink. And his sister stood afar off to wit what would be done to him, and the daughter of Pharaoh came down to wash herself at the river, and her maidens walked along by the riverside. And when she saw the ark among the flags, she sent her maid to fetch it. And when she had opened it, she saw the child, and behold, the babe wept. And she had compassion on him and said, This is one of the Hebrews' children. Amen. That is speaking of Jochebed, Moses' mother. Brother Jesse, Galatians chapter number 6, verse number 2. Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. Amen. Mothers fulfill the law of Christ. They certainly bear our burdens. Let's stand for the reading of our golden text. Again, may I direct your attention to the book of Romans, the 12th chapter and the 15th verse. The Bible says, Rejoice with them that do rejoice, and weep with them that weep. Notice that word, rejoice. To have joy and to express it repeatedly. To express it over and over. Joy. I want to preach a message the Holy Ghost titled, Jochebed's Joy. May we pray, Heavenly Father, we love and we praise you. We thank you for the opportunity to come to your house. I thank you for each and every one that is in this building. I thank you for your goodness and for your mindfulness, Lord. I pray that you would anoint this thy servant, set a guard at my mouth, and help me to say the things that you would have me to say. Nothing more or less, I'll be held accountable to you, God. So when I say those things I didn't want to say, Lord, it's because you commissioned me. I didn't ask for this. You enlisted me, and I need you to help me be obedient to you. Anoint the ears of this thy people, God. Anoint them to hear what the Spirit of God says unto the church through your word of God, through the preached word, not of my words. I pray, God, that we would be those that hear and those that heed. May we depart this place joyfully and not sorrowfully. In Jesus' name, and the church says, Amen. 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 Look at your neighbor and say, Hey, neighbor, do you have joy in that heart? I hope so. I want you to be full of joy. Praise the Lord. Our text is found in a New Testament book of the Holy Bible. The book of Romans is a treatise of the great Apostle Paul. The recipients of this letter are believers who live in Rome. Believers who are scattered throughout the Roman Empire. Paul, as a spiritual father, begins to minister through the written page. He put pen to parchment, begins to reach out to his brothers and sisters in Christ and also his spiritual children that have been scattered because of the oppression of religious people that did not like the idea that a new religion or a new covenant had arisen. And it is certainly a wildfire that is spreading by the power of of the Holy Ghost, and these mere mortals attempted to put out that fire. And anybody that knows anything about fire, especially when it becomes wildfire and it begins to spread out of control, if you do not go to proper measures in order to restrain it or put it out, you will only cause it to be accelerated. You will cause it to spread even more quickly. I've seen people before attempt to put fires out that have started on their kitchen stove and because they didn't go to proper measures of restraining and subduing and quenching that fire, they only hastened the spread of it. The end result was the burning down of mom and dad's house. And that's what happened here. The great apostle Paul 
being led by the Holy Ghost, the holy man that had been moved on by the Holy Ghost. He just added fuel to the fire. And whenever these Christians were becoming martyrs, experiencing martyrdom, and that's why they were filled with the Holy Ghost. It wasn't only so they could run around the church with great joy. It wasn't only that they could die and face the Lord with peace and joy in their heart. They received the Holy Ghost that they might be able to withstand the persecution of people simply refusing to accept this new religion. Primarily it was the Jews that did not like this new covenant. This new religion called Christianity. Jesus came into this world to bring that old covenant to a full. He did not try to destroy it or throw it away or discard it as you would a piece of paper in a trash bucket. No, he brought it up to the full. In fact, Jesus Christ one time while speaking to religious leaders, he said, if you do this, it's bad, it's sinful, it's wrong, it's unacceptable. But if you commit that trespass in your heart, it's sinful, it's despicable, it's disgusting, and it's unacceptable. It seems like Jesus didn't come into this world to loosen things up. He came into this world to tighten up humanity because he wants to present us unto his heavenly father as that glorious bride. That bride that's wearing that garment that is spotless, that is wrinkle free. And so we know that Apostle Paul, after that, he had been converted. He had been known as Christianity's greatest persecutor at that time. But he becomes Christianity's greatest promoter. And he feels the need to bear his brother's burdens. A lot of times while he was bearing his brother's burdens, he was in dark prison houses. Some of the epistles that make up a large part of the New Testament were penned in prisons. Nasty, filthy, despicable prisons. This man picked himself up by his own nap and his own neck and, and he began to encourage others. And he had a burden for others and he had a joy in his heart concerning the things that God was doing for these believers. And one of the things that God was doing for these believers was helping them through this miserable life. Jesus had assigned mercy for their misery. I don't know about you all, but the night I got saved, that's what I was telling the Lord. I am miserable. I am sick and tired of the way that I'm living. I'm fed up with it. I've had enough of it. I'm physically sick. I get it, Lord. I'm through with it. Things that I did not understand up until now, I understand that I had fallen into the snare of the devil. And that I was being held captive, seemingly against my own will. And I was desiring liberty and freedom in my being. And that's what Apostle Paul was dealing with himself prior to his conversion. He was struggling. That's why when he was on his road to Damascus with letters in his hand to imprison, persecute, and even execute people that call themselves Christians while he's traveling on that road to Damascus, there appears a light shining from out of heaven that appears to be brighter than the noonday sun and the words of the Lord Jesus whom he professed to serve. He's a Pharisee among the Pharisees. This guy is a preacher among the preachers. He's a teacher of all teachers. He's been schooled in the religion of Judaism at the very feet of Judaism's finest scholar, Gamaliel. And he knows all of this, but somehow he's miserable. He knows who Jehovah is. He knows him by his name. He's familiar with the Torah. He's familiar with the law of Moses. He can recite it. But somehow there's still this God-sized hole in his chest. And he's persecuting people that are living a fulfilled life. And y'all know what happens after that the Holy Ghost smites him down. He falls off of that high horse. 
And he ends up in the dust and he picks himself up and says, Who art thou, Lord? He knew very well whom he had been kicking against. And Jesus said, It's hard for you to kick against the pricks. What he was saying is, Things get better in your life temporarily, but until you fully surrender to me and my will for your life, you're going to be miserable. You're not going to have a joy inside. I know that after I got saved and surrendered to the Lord, I've had a joy in my heart. This experience has been one full of unspeakable joy and full of glory. And so even though Apostle Paul finds himself in prison and put pen to parchment and writing such a letter to these babes in Christ, he's got a burden for them. He's concerned about their feelings. He's concerned about their emotions. He's concerned about what they're going through. Yes, he had had a personal experience that was fulfilling. But he's worried about somebody else. And that's the kind of people in our company right here this morning. Mothers. Mothers. They are, they are so selfless. They're not selfish. They're so selfless. You look at these precious women that are here today. Whether they are somebody's biological mother, stepmother, or perhaps they've never given birth to any child whatsoever. But inside... Of that chest, there's this precious soul, and this precious spirit, this being. Their very existence, Brother Philip, testifies to us that God knew exactly what mankind needed. When he looked upon the state of Adam, he said it's not good for this man to be alone. We've already heard this a little while ago through the personal testimony of Brother Nathaniel. I went to Walmart. I bought $80 worth of ingredients for a mac and cheese because the brothers are cooking for the ladies, the sisters today. But he admitted just a little while ago, I needed that touch of the mother. I needed some personal assistance. I needed some help. Brother Christian said I made the mashed potatoes, but I too needed a little help. It's okay to admit in this life while you have breath in your body and before it's everlasting too late that I need help. No matter how strong you are, no matter how spirit-filled these believers were, they were being persecuted. Paul wrote to the Hebrew people, the descendants of Abraham. He said, some of you have had your spouses cut in half. Some of you have witnessed the execution of dear loved ones because of your loved one believing in Jesus Christ of all things. I know in this day and hour in which we live in, I need the support of every spiritual mother that I can get. I need the encouragement from every spiritual mother that I can receive because truly we are living in perilous times. And we need help. And sometimes when we first admit it, we say, I need help. A mother is the one that shows up. Agree with me, if you will. When there is a crisis in your life, who's the first person that comes to mind? Is it your praying mother? Is it your God-fearing mother? Because you need spiritual support. Because you feel needy at that time, you lean on the shoulders of your mother first. You know why that is? Because God ordained it, the very per first person that you leaned upon after your birth. The one that they laid you upon, the shoulder that you laid upon was that of your mother. And Apostle Paul served as a spiritual mother to these people. And he was not hesitant at all to recognize their need. Now, there is no doubt this man was suffering in body. There is no doubt this man was miserable in spirit. But he felt the need, Brother Jesse, to send out this letter to these Romans. And it, it begins with an appeal to these babes in Christ. And he speaks to them about your will. Now, how many of you feel like Apostle Paul for some time 
had been bucking the will of God. I remember that was the reason for my misery because I knew that I knew that one day I'd be doing what I'm doing right now. And in this opening prayer this morning, you heard me say, God, you know I did not sign up for this. There are things that I have to say as a preacher, as a minister, that I would have never said had he not told me to pastor people and to serve as their shepherd. So Apostle Paul immediately, what's on his mind is, I want to talk to you about your will. So Paul's appeal to these babes in Christ, he speaks to them about their will. And he says, you must be willing to experience a reset in your life. That was something I had to come to grips with and come to terms with. That I have to allow a reset in my life. Look at your neighbor and say, hey neighbor. Are you willing to allow God to reset your life? When Apostle Paul was ministering through the written page to the church at Corinth, in one of his later letters, in 2 Corinthians chapter number 5 and verse number 17, he said, therefore, we've reached a conclusion, in other words. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away, and behold, all things become new. Paul told believers that they were to present their bodies as a living sacrifice. God desired to repossess these people because their souls belonged to him. He wanted their spirit, their flesh, and their mind as well as their soul. You know, the Bible said that we should love the Lord God with our entire being and our existence. It's in him we live and move and have our being. And God mandated that we love him with our heart our mind and our spirit. There's a lot of people today they are okay with the fact that their soul belongs to God. Brother Gene Wooten used to tell Tyler and Gina often something, and I still laugh about this sometimes when I'm driving down the road. Somebody asked me, I said, what in the world is so funny right now? The song that's playing on the stereo is not funny. The sermon that we're listening to right now is not funny. What is so funny? I said, I'm not with y'all right now. Right now, I'm in the company of Brother Gene Wooten down there at our little storefront church. And I'm watching him with his shirt untucked and that curly hair that he had is balding slightly on the top. And the way he would waddle over there in his Crocs or his shoes. And I'm, I'm, I'm listening to him blister Tyler verbally. And at the end of that, he would say, your soul may be God's, but your butt is mine. And he'd let him know, if you don't straighten up, picking on Brother LaRue is totally unacceptable. If you don't straighten up, I am going to get you a little bit when I get home. He was trying to mold the wheel of his grandson. And Apostle Paul, he would not have bit off on the mindset of most Christians today. It is true that our soul belongs to God, but I want to give God my will. I want to give him my emotional being, my heart. I want to give him my spirit, my desires, my cravings, my appetites. Why in the world would I be so bent on feasting at the devil's buffet when I know that I can enjoy the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living and that's what Apostle Paul was telling these people do not be afraid one bit about receiving a reset of life because the world ain't going to understand it but you're not going to regret it the very moment that God hits the reset button and you find out that your will is his will that things you once hated you now love that things you once loved you love you now hate it you will have no regret at all they needed a reset of life if they were believers and had been truly converted, then the requirement to be a living sacrifice wasn't too much to be required of them. 
He said, present your bodies unto Christ, which is your reasonable sacrifice. These people had been pagan people prior to their conversion. This lets me know there is nothing whatsoever that you can do that would keep God from wanting to save you. These people would have been familiar with the pagan practice of sacrifice. Not only sacrificing fruits and animals, but human sacrifice. And that's what Paul was saying to people that were familiar with sacrifice. He was saying in this book of Romans, present your body unto God a living sacrifice. You're already sacrificing peace. You're already sacrificing joy. You're already sacrificing happiness. Why not sacrifice yourself unto God? Seems reasonable to me to be done with sin and to embrace life. It seems reasonable to me to say I'm sick and tired of the way my life's been going. I need more than turning over a new leaf experience. I need more than just the new year resolution. I need a reset. Oh, I feel the Holy Ghost in this place. I'm trying not to run too fast this morning. I want to be mindful of our mothers, but our mothers are these kind of people. Their life is reset the moment they become a mother. I saw it with Sister Howard. Her life forever changed the moment she became a mother. It was on December the 5th, 1995. I saw that woman's countenance change. Not only did I lose my breath at the sound of my oldest son's first cries, when I heard that, I lost my breath because I realized the awesome responsibility of being a father to a child. And I saw my wife who had enjoyed undisturbed sleep for the first time have that sweet rest I preached about last Sunday morning disturbed hour after hour. At the hour. There was a change of heart and will. Our stubborn will has to change. Sometimes children have a way of changing our stubborn will. I'm going somewhere. Y'all hang tight with me. If you look at our golden text, Romans 12 and 15, it said, Rejoice with them that do rejoice and weep with them that reap. Weep with them that weep. I can think of some people who personify that scripture. They're sitting in this building this morning. Every mother in this building this morning personifies the scripture. They are the very embodiment of this verse to me. Mothers. Most mothers, not every mother. Most mothers rejoice with them who rejoice. And they weep with them who weep. I've seen their children before get bumps and bruises. And that mother has been connected to that child so well that she hurts when they hurt. Whenever they color their first picture, they're very pleased with the end result, even though the child was out of lines, out of bounds. Come on now. Your mother still loves you, even though she knows very well you've been out of line and out of bounds many times. She has wept with you when you've wept, and she's rejoiced with you when she rejoiced, when you rejoiced. But Brother Jesse, the greatest joy is when you realize you have become who you are today because of the nourishment of your mother, because of her unconditional support and love, and just because of her prayers. God's mercy has been extended to you time and again when the devil thought that he had snuck up on you to extinguish your life. To extinguish your life from existence, your mother succored you, meaning she, by divine intervention, protected and preserved you. And you're here today. Wouldn't it be great for it to be sad? My mother got to see me living in bounds. My mother got to see me living within the leather binders of this blessed book. I know that Jesus fulfilled the law. And I know that Jesus is the one that made the way for me. 
And I know that it comes through faith and the goodness and the grace of God alone. But also Apostle Paul was telling these people, there are some things as Christians that you've got to do if you're going to profess to be a child of God. Now I know what I'm feeling right here in my soul. Mothers are living sacrifices. In this generation, they don't want to sacrifice anything. Although they are sacrificing a lot. They're missing out on a lot of wonderful things. They're sacrificing a lot more than they realize. I've had people before tell me after they prayed to be saved. They've said, where have I been all of my life to have missed such peace and joy? That's what happened to me in October 1992. I said, Lord, I had no idea. That I could have peace and joy in this measure. Where have I been? It's not that I hadn't been on the church pew. It's not that I had not been to revival services. It's not that I did not own a copy of the English translation of the Bible. But I asked myself, where have I been all these years? I've sacrificed so much. You've heard people say before. I, I'm so sorry that I got saved so late in life. I realize I'm at the age of 60 and finally I decided to serve God. And if I had it to do all over again, the songwriter pen, I serve Jesus every day of my life. There's another old song that they used to sing way back years ago. Wasted years. Oh, how foolish. Well, if we've lost some precious time and some precious years, we better get started right now. And that's the words of encouragement that we find in the scripture that said, Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, right now. I paraphrase, today is the day of salvation. Amen. These mothers are living a sacrifice. Mothers have experienced a reset of life and will. Good mothers are selfless. They are given to sacrifice. A mother is best described as a loving, selfless person who will sacrifice anything for her children. And when we say anything for her children, that includes her health, her emotional well-being, and her very own life. We've heard the stories of those mothers that have been trapped in a bitter winter cold. And how they have covered their babies with their own arms and their own coats. And how after rescuers found that mother and that child, the child was still alive. But the mother was dead because the mother shielded her child from death. So is the case of Jochebed. That we just read about that decree had went forth from Pharaoh. Because it was a selfish decree. He realized that God was blessing his people down there in the land of Goshen. And Pharaoh was not happy about it, so he brought them under oppression. The Bible said the taskmasters were being very burdensome to the people of God. Is not the devil a hard taskmaster? Oh, yes, and even though these people of God were being persecuted, they continued to have joy. And they continued to be fruitful, and they multiplied, and they prospered. And Pharaoh decreed that all of the male children be executed. Upon their birth, the Egyptian midwives were to take them babies to put them in woven baskets. And after a hard day of work, they were to take those baskets and dump out the contents. And that would have been five-pound babies, six-pound babies, seven-pound babies, eight-pound babies, nine-pound babies, premature babies, Hebrew babies, every one of them. Throw them male children into the crocodile infested waters of the Nile River. This mother Jochebed, she said to herself, I will not let this happen to my baby. Mothers, there's no time like now to decide I am not going to let that mean ruthless, cruel, conniving, scheming, nasty, filthy Lucifer have my baby. The devil would love nothing more than to sink his nasty teeth into your child's precious soul and to do a spiritual death roll and take them to the bottom to be devoured later in eternal, deep, everlasting hell. 
There's no bottom. No bottom. No bottom. How about it, mothers? Jochebed risked her very own life by disobeying the orders of Pharaoh. Are you okay with disobeying the orders of Lucifer? Because he is the God of this world. And rather than following his orders, a lot of people deceive themselves and they feel like I'm my own person. That's been said about Brother Howell before. Within the last 10 years, he's his own man. And that's true in a good way, but that could also be true for others in a bad way. Because before I was converted, I felt like I could walk without him holding my hand. I felt like I was doing things myself. I felt like I was doing things of my own accord and my own free will. But what I realized after some time is actually I'm following the Pied Piper. And after some time, I'm going to have to pay the Piper. Are y'all with me in this house? A reset is needed. A spiritual awakening. What has happened to me? How did I end up here? How did I go this far? I took a little detour of my own choosing, but I never would have thought that I'd end up here in this position, in this place. Now, when Moses' mother was receiving this order from Pharaoh, Brother Jesse, she was not obedient to that calling. And that's what Apostle Paul said concerning the calling that came from Christ. He said, I was obedient to the heavenly calling. Who are we obeying? Who are we following? Whose orders are we following? Because if we're not keeping God's commandments, we're following the devil's orders, right? Or, or are we following the orders of ourselves? I keep feeling the spirit bump me here, so I'm, I'm holding on just a minute and stay tarrying right here for a little while. The Lord said, you cannot serve two masters. Through his servant, he said, you cannot serve two masters. So if you're not serving God fully, you're serving the devil fully. I'm talking to young people in this building, preachers' children, pastors' grandchildren. The king of this world has decreed that you cast your child into crocodile infested waters. Now, Jochebed right then could have just said, you know what? I resigned to do that. I will do just that. But no, she went to hide that baby. And once that baby's voice was able to be discerned and heard from the place where she had hid it from. Brother Sterrett, then she makes an ark of bulrushes. And she pitches it within and without. She sets it afloat in the Nile River. And she sets a guard to watch over it, which is Moses' sister, Miriam. I'm here Sunday after Sunday, Wednesday after Wednesday, because I feel like God expects me to guard the souls of these people. I'm here because my wife, needs to guard the souls of our children. If you could get the eerie picture and get the imagery of crocodiles swimming through this world. Recently, a very foolish man made the statement that he could connect in a way to a crocodile that would keep that crocodile from attacking him. Have you heard about it Brother Rocap? It was somewhere overseas. And so the video clip. Depicts and shows that I've seen the clip. He goes out in the middle. Of some muddy water. And he's out there. And he's got his arms. Extended straight out. You know kind of like Jesus did. When he was on the cross. And then he'll hold his breath and go under. He'll submerge himself in that water and pop up and smile and let everybody know that he can control the spirit of the crocodile. 
And that, that crocodile will pay respect to him. And because of what's in him, that crocodile won't touch him. And it'll be merciful. We have to be careful not to deceive ourselves because, you know, God's not a respecter of persons and neither is the devil. The devil wants the pastor. He wants the parishioner. The devil wants you and he wants your child. And sometimes we feel like we've got the devil on a leash. We feel like we've got that ox goat in our hand and we can keep the devil, you know, back. And we won't be caught by surprise. That car accident won't happen. We'll have a deathbed opportunity to pray. That massive heart attack. We don't expect that, do we? So there he was out there in those muddy waters just having a good time. Acting like one of them synchronized swimmers, you know, putting on a good show. After a while, he went to swim. And one of the onlookers said, look, there's some bubbles over there. He went down, acted like he defied that crocodile. How dare you even come near me? Under the water, he put on a big display, a show. And Brother Jesse, just when he thought he was done, because he was in control, you see, just when he thought he was done, he started swimming to the edge of that pond. And just before he grabbed the bank, <clears throat> he was snatched against his will under the surface of the water. And the crocodile drowned him, rolled with him. After some time, he was released. He was a mangled, marred. Jochebed was saying, I could comply with the mandates of Pharaoh. And I could be politically correct in this world. I never have felt the need to be politically correct. But she could have took her own baby boy straight out of her loins, tossed it in one of them woven baskets, and took it, dumped it in the Nile herself. But Brother Nathaniel, she was going to see to it that that nasty crocodile didn't get her baby. You know, there were some devils that I fought in public high school and in organized sports as being on the teams and team captains. There were some devils I fought that my children shouldn't have to fight. I'm feeling the Holy Ghost and I've slowed it down on purpose because I don't want to overlook something here. But mothers, it's not about us. It's about others. Right. It's never about us. It's about Jesus. And you mothers have taught us this. You have taught us how to be selfless and not selfish. When I think of a loving, selfless person, I think of Sister Howell. I think of all these other mothers in here that are willing to sacrifice so many things for their children. A good mother doesn't hesitate for one moment to enter the joys and the sorrows of their children. Remember our text? They rejoice with those that rejoice and they weep with them that weep. Moses' mother, Jochebed, was a selfless woman, one who cared deeply for her son, who faced an uncertain future in faith. Without God, our children are facing an uncertain future in faith. And I realize that. In fact, that was the reason why I gave my heart to the Lord. It has been said of my uncle, who was a barroom brawling fighting machine, a drugging machine. It has been said that whenever he found out his wife was expecting their son, that he went home and fell down beside his bed and he prayed and said, God, this is no lifestyle to raise a child in. God honored his pure heart's desire and gloriously saved him. He was saved in that moment. He received a reset. Hey, the world don't want you to think you can be liberated 
from the jaws of the crocodile, the devil, but you can be liberated in a moment. The Bible said, whom the Son has made free is free indeed. We do not have to struggle in a lifestyle of sin indefinitely. There isn't much said about Jochebed in the sacred writ. But from what I do read of this dear woman in the second chapter of the book of Exodus, I read about her character. I can't help but admire her as I read about her love for her children. She's not only the daughter of a Levite. She's not only the woman that married Amram the Levite of the tribe of Levi. That's a wonderful thing to know that you're a child of the tribe of Levi. But brother Gabriel, she was more than the wife of Amram. She was more than the mother of Aaron, Miriam, and Moses. She was a child of God. She was one who protected her children when Pharaoh decreed that every male Hebrew child should be killed. She arose for his protection. Jochebed was one that was not afraid to face difficulties with her children. And I want every person in this building to listen to me very carefully. I thank God for our natural and spiritual mothers that are willing to get into the fight and fight with us. They may be the weaker vessel according to scripture in some ways. But there's no warrior like a mother. When you're in the heat of a battle, whether that be with the government, the judicial system, peer pressure, with the devil himself. When you're in a battle, suddenly you realize your mother has come to help you fight. And she's back to back with you. And she's fighting for you. And to know that that mother's got your back. Jochebed was such a woman that had her children's back in times of difficulty and trials. From what I read in the book of Exodus, I would have liked to have known this woman. Sister how she shone beautifully in dark times. Everything looked hopeless for the family of Amram. But this dear woman whom was a human being too that hurt the same way they hurt. She had Moses' back. She had feelings, Brother Tyler, like the mothers present in this building do today. But she did not just plop down on the couch and brood about the current situation in Egypt. Don't expect me just to plop down on the couch and watch the crocodiles of this world take my grandchildren. If God be my helper, and he will be because he promised he would. I'm not going to let the devil have one of these people in this church. Not one of my children, not one of your grandchildren, nobody. Oh, come on now, the society is telling God and mom just to pop down on the couch and the brood and your disappointments. Be discouraged. Don't do nothing about it. Let us educate your children to their own demise. Oh, no. Not this woman, Jochebed. It was her joy to arise to the occasion of saving her own family. Mama, you can make the difference. The situation is not out of hand. It is not out of control. You are the one that God's waiting on uh, to make the difference in that situation. And there should be no greater joy than in doing so. I'm preaching a message the Holy Ghost titled, Jacobet's Joy. Amen. What about the current situation in the United States of America? It's bleak. It's dark. But like Jacobin, we're not going to leave our little baby Moseses to themselves. Because we believe, as Jochebed believed in concerning Moses, she believed Moses was God's man. And I believe every person in this building is God's child. You are not the offspring of the devil. You belong to God. And it would be a 
our reasonable service to say, God, I acknowledge that my soul belongs to you, and it would be my good pleasure to serve you, to experience a reset, and to serve you with great joy all the days of my life. This dear mother shouldered the burden of others in times of sorrow. We rejoice with those that rejoice. We weep with those that weep. She shouldered the burden of others in times of sorrow. Amen. Brother Jesse, I want you to put Malachi on your shoulders. There's a lot of people surrendering instead of shouldering. I said there's a lot of people surrendering instead of shouldering. Now look at this father as he walks around with his son. I'm telling you there is a great joy on that child's face. Even though that is a situation for embarrassment because the joy is so great of what he is experiencing. He's forgot about me. He's forgot about you. He forgot that we're in the Mother's Day service. Come on, Mother Jesse. All that matters is that he's being shouldered by a parent. And moms and dads, what a difference we would make if our children could say they did not surrender. They shouldered. Oh, my God. In heaven. That's how we fulfill the law of Christ. By bearing. What a mother's burden. God, are you hurting? God, are you going through it? Son, are you going through it? When I'm going through it with you. I promise I'll be with you. I love you unconditionally. I pray. I believe you. Oh, thank God. I feel the glory of God in this place. I'm telling somebody in this building, God surrender. Shoulder. Suck the best joy was to shoulder the burden of her baby. As she carried the basket, she shouldered it. And when she had opened it, she saw the child. And behold, the baby wept. And she had compassion on him. And said, this is one of the Hebrews' children. Brother Jesse, would you come to the piano? Let's stand this morning. Pharaoh's daughter was going out to the river to bathe herself. With the bodyguards around, she hears a noise. And in that basket, there's a Hebrew baby. And she names him. Withdrawn. That's his name. Moses. Withdrawn. What she's saying is, I have withdrew him out of this sketchy situation. I have withdrew him from harm's way. I have pulled him out. So not only did Jacob and Miriam keep watch over Moses. Now, here's another mother, Pharaoh's daughter. When Moses was weeping, she wept, said, bring me that little baby. She empathized with the pain of him missing his mother. And I came this morning with empathy, so much more than sympathy. I want to tell somebody that's full of sorrow and anguish and travail of spirit that God has spoke to me over the last couple of days and he's let me know you're sick and tired of it all. And he wants to bear your pain and your burdens. These women empathize with the pain of others. They had true compassion. They deliberately chose to step into someone else's world to assist them tirelessly. They shouldered them and helped them bear their burdens. I want to tell somebody this morning, you don't have to bear your burdens alone. You've got a friend. God will help you. Just as Apostle Paul had such a tremendous burden to help the saints that have been scattered throughout the Roman Empire. Just as Apostle Paul, a 
emphasized. Empathy is such a powerful word. The meaning of that word is so powerful. Empathized. I have felt the pain, Sister Howell, of some that are present today. Upon my bed, warm tears flowed down my face. And I said, God, I feel the pain, the hurt. I perceive the brokenness, the misery. It's unbearable. They're saying enough is enough. It's time for a reset. For the prisoner that walks out of a prison in which he had spent 30 plus years because he took the life of someone else's child. Usually the only hand that he could expect to meet him at the gate is that of his own mother. And I know that we've all done things that we're ashamed of. Some we've admitted to. Some you have not confessed. But I want you to know this morning at this altar right here at this gate. There's a hand. That's welcoming you to a new life. To a new beginning. And it would bring Jesus no greater joy. In fact, the Bible said that the angels in heaven rejoice over one sinner that repented. More than 99 just persons that need no repentance. This morning on this Mother's Day service, May the 12th of 2024. The Lord has extended an invitation for somebody to pray through their woes and their troubles and trials. Jacobin's secret for her happiness in dark times was her willingness to help others. Mothers are givers. They give of oneself. And sometimes that giving doesn't feel great. From experience, Sister Howell could say that sometimes it leaves us feeling depleted and exhausted. Mothers give until it hurts. But it's their life. Their selfless giving is their life. And Jesus expressed and demonstrated no greater love than through the death of the cross. Is there somebody in this building this morning? As we bow our heads and close our eyes, is there somebody present that would say, Pastor Howell, I'm miserable. I need the joy that you've preached about. I need a reset. Would you raise your hand? Is there anybody? There's one, there's two, there's three. I'll tell you what we're going to do. We're just going to slip into an altar of prayer, pray right where you're at. I want you to know God told me he'll give you that reset of life. And you're going to have this joy that Jacobin had. Jacobin's joy. You don't have to bear it alone. Jesus is going to help you. What would I do without the shoulder of my mother to lean on? Someone has said sisters to pray with this sister right here on the end. Sister Howell. Sister Hannah, my daughter, wherever you're at. Somebody else want to pray? Come on. You don't have to bear the burden. You don't have to bear the burden. Oh, thank you, 
Jesus, thank you, Jesus. God will hide the pain in your That's right. Freedom, the sorrow. They hold you. Just take my 